Hello. My name is Adil Tessie. Thank you for taking the time to see this video. I will make it for you so you are part of this unique way. This video will show you how agreement drafting can be a really good basis for your travel. Basis is a leader in the financial services industry with an 18 year and $100 billion asset servicing history. This invaluable experience gained during these years and dealing with diverse clientele has led us to develop a comprehensive software tool that helps manage the effort, time, and resources of an organization in drafting an agreement or a complex agreement. This is a result of four years of product design and research, and I'm sure you like it. Business Master Draft is made in India for the world. It is an aid to drafting simple and complex agreements. It is under patenting process in India right now. It can be used by all kinds of business and government enterprises to help draft agreements and complex documents. With a wide spectrum of features, this service is ideal for contract drafters who work in various industries and we need a number of tools or utilities to draft an agreement. The Basis Master Draft program was designed to believe that a well-drafted document is equivalent to an effective argument. It has been created by users, coded by technicians who heard the users, and validated by legal professionals. An unbeatable combination, isn't it? Here is a quick view of the features. Everything is online, so no mist and editing all emotions. No chaos. Provides a repository of templates while allowing the user to load his own templates. Agreements can be built bottom top using cross libraries, including cross tools. Hence, the drafter keeps track of comments made by reviewers by enabling adding documents during the drafting process. Collaborators can add comments as reviewers in any time, hence making a repository of feedback from the team members. This makes the drafting of agreements a seamless and a faster and more efficient way. Helps bring transparency and openness in agreements of document drafting and negotiation with tenants. Incorporates a unique clause locking system where the parties can lock clauses which have been agreed upon by them. Provides for a voice to text option to enable drafters to dictate clauses of the software and then edit it suitably. Ability to sign the document digitally using other in India or Google instead. We welcome all to experience this comprehensive service that helps organizations draft intricate agreements in a revolutionary way. The team heading business master draft strives to add perfection through contracting services also. That was really wonderful to hear about and know, and I'm sure everyone here is going to be ha going to have a few questions about it at the end for Aditya as well. But now it's time for me to invite Mayur Sejpalji on stage. Uh, an NBA by qualification, Mayurji has over 10 years of experience in investment and financial advising. He is the owner of Wealthcraft, co-founder of the Precred Venture Private Limited, and a director of Saffron Factory Private Limited. He is also part of the core committee of the Hindu Economic Forum and a Sir Pramukh of VHP Prasar, uh, VHP Prasar Prachar of the Konkan Prant. Mayurji, it's my pleasure to welcome you on stage. And I'd also like to call back Raviji for a couple of comments that he'd like to make. Namaskaram. I have been requested to introduce to Harsh Madhusudanji to this audience. 
Harsh Ji is an investor, economist, and famous author of multiple books. He is a public interest director on the board of NSC International, International Exchange. He is a CFA chartered holder, instead MBA, and Dartmouth graduate. He dropped out IIT Delhi to study economics. He earlier worked, with, worked for Bain, MIT, JPL, and other organizations. So now, Harji, please come on the stage and share your valuable thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much, Mayur. I think I'll stand and talk if it's okay because it's coffee sham ho gayi hai. Some coffee pi rahe hain. Sabko thodi si neend aa rahi hai. Um, thank you so much to the organizer, the Hindu Economic Forum. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to Mayur. Uh, thank you to Aditya. Thank you to everybody who's uh, organized this event. The topic that I have been given is the roadmap for Bharatiya economy by 2047. So that's the keynote address today. Uh, also, thank you to the earlier speaker. Before I begin, I'll uh, just briefly mention, I think you mentioned about the books. Um, and there was a discussion on this very briefly in the question and answer session. I've, I've written two books. I'm currently writing my third book. The first book was on derivatives. Um, so I have a view or two on that. It was co-authored with uh, Dr. T.V. Somanathan, who's currently the finance secretary and Dr. Anant Nageshwaran, who's currently the uh, Chief Economic Advisor of India. The second book is called A New Idea of India. That is co-authored with my friend, who's a venture capitalist based in Calcutta, but also often lives in Mumbai, called Rajiv Mantri. And the third book, which I'm currently finishing, is called Long India, which is very broadly similar to what we are writing or what we are talking about today. So first, let's, let's begin by understanding this this 2047 obviously is for symbolic reasons, right? It's 100 years of independence. The Prime Minister has said Amrit Kal from 2022, the last 25 years of the centenary, so to speak. And I think it's understandable if people have some, if not a cynical, slightly skeptical take on it, right? Is it just a marketing gimmick? Is it just a political gimmick? Um, in my humble view, it is not, although of course it does not hurt to have those round numbers. So. What does it mean to try to you know, be a developed economy by 2047 or thereabouts? So what is, what is India's per capita income right now? Who knows? 1,35,000. OK. Uh, that's a slightly outdated number. Yes, I think it's around $2,400. Depends. So more, almost 2 lakh rupees right now. But yes, that number was also correct last two years ago. Um, what is the US's per capita income? $36,000. OK, again, slightly outdated. Ajah, if people have Google, I mean, I'm giving you some time. $75,000. The US per capita income is $75,000. So, which is why they have around 330 million people. Therefore, their GDP is around $25 trillion, which is about one fourth of the world's economy. Uh, so, $25 trillion, one-fourth of the world economy, which means the world economy is how much? $100 trillion. Last year's number. It's around $100 trillion. Uh, this year actually will be $108, $109 trillion. And that is in market exchange terms. So, there is something called PPP. What is PPP? Purchasing power parity. So, purchasing power parity, oh, what do we mean by that? So is it, is it not the case that the cost of living in Mumbai is different from Lucknow? Definitely, right? I mean, some of you have some painful stories about that. So similarly, the cost of living is different between India and the US. And these numbers are always a rough number because, you know, uh, it's never a one-to-one -one comparison. But roughly, if you go by official numbers, it's three and a half to four times the multiplier. and uh, according to my calculations, is actually slightly higher. Okay, So let us say India's per capita income adjusted for purchasing power parity or cost of living is actually around $10,000, right? Slightly more than four times of $2,400. So how many times is the US per capita income higher than India's? It's around more than 30 times higher 
if you just do a one-to-one -one comparison. But it's only about seven, eight times higher if you adjust for cost of living, right? So this is the gap. First of all, of course, we must think of China. But I think uh, it is imperative that we must think globally. I think some, to some extent, India got into the development game partially because our large neighbor and sometimes enemy, the communist China became relatively rich. And I think our aspirations should be even higher. So if the world's richest country is around seven times, eight times richer per person, um, then the question is, how long does it take to traverse that gap, if at all we can? So that will, in a way, I'm just, before I'm giving you the answer, I just want to set that as a stage. Now, why, does, why should we be bullish on India? Right? In financial markets, there is often a saying which says, uh, anybody who tells you this time is different is wrong. Right? Anybody who comes and tells you this time is different is probably wrong. But I am here to tell you that this time is different. This time is different for the India story. The reason I'm saying that is because you might have heard what some people call India boosterism for decades now. You know, some of you are clearly older than me. So you must have heard it for a long time. But I'll try to convince you. Uh, so I, I'll speak for about half an hour and then we'll have quick some question answers. So I think by the end of it, I want to try to convince you why this time is different genuinely for India. And therefore what the roadmap is around for the next 25 years, roughly one generation. So, first of all, let me just break down that reasons into three buckets. Democracy, scale, and innovation. So what are the three buckets? Democracy, scale, and innovation. Now, these are three reasons why I think we should be bullish on India. And some of these will be counterintuitive. Many of you might have heard that we are poor because we are a democracy. Some of you might have heard we are poor because we are just too far too many of us. And some of you might have heard that we only do jugar, there is no innovation in India, right? So all three reasons are slightly counterintuitive. Now why is, and the three reasons are actually not only counterintuitive, they're intrinsically interlinked to each other. So why is democracy so important? So have you ever, like, what, what happened in 1761? I mean, this is Hindu economic forum, people have no memory. Third battle of Panipat. So does it not strike you strange that, you know, somebody from just Afghanistan, which is not a very dense country, popular, it's not a very fertile country, it's a small country, could just come and conquer or defeat armies here around Delhi in Haryana, Panipat. And that's, that's been the situation for hundreds of years, right? What is different today? No, no, what, why? What is different today? Because we have our own state, right? We have our own state. We didn't have a state. Even the Marathas at their peak, from Atak to Katak, but they, as far as the Indo-Gangetic Plains was, except some raids, they never really controlled territory for a long time in the plains, where the real population density of India is. So India today has a state. So why does India have a state? For multiple reasons, but clearly one reason is it's a democracy. I mean, just imagine, it's in, in, the Chinese are relatively homogeneous, so if Xi Jinping becomes a dictator, nobody says he's from that region or that caste or that language. You might like him or dislike him, but you're not going to like him or dislike him for that reason. Because they're essentially Han. Because they're essentially Han, right? I mean, of course, some of their uh, diversity can be sometimes underplayed. They're not as homogeneous as it seems. The regional dialects, their standard Mandarin has been standardized more on the script than the language. But in China, it's, you might like or dislike him for other reasons, not because of caste or region or language, right? In India, it's almost impossible to have a dictator. Right? It's just, you, we'll be fighting with each other before we know anything. So the reason India is united, for whatever historical reasons, along with the fact of its dharmic core, is that it's a democracy, right? They go along together. So that is, I'll get into details, but I want to first give a quick overview. That democracy allows 1.4 billion people to be in one polity. So this year you must have read in headlines that India has overtaken the Chinese in population. Right, it was actually some people are saying next year, some people said it already happened last year, but roughly we've equaled if not already overtaken the Chinese in population. Which brings me to the next point, scale. 
So what did Donald Trump do when he came to power in terms of policy with respect to China? He started a trade war, right? So for 40, 50 years, 60 years, since the end of the World War, Second World War, the US has been talking about free trade. No, we must do free trade, we must do free trade. And occasionally, even internally within India, we have a lot of disagreements and debates on this, right? There's a Swadeshi Jagran Manch, there is a liberalization lobby. People have views based on good intentions. But one thing is very clear now that the world's leading economy is turning protectionist, right? For whatever geopolitical reasons, they just passed a climate change bill, they just passed a semiconductor bill, whatever names they give it, basically they're trying to bring more and more, especially high-tech industry back home. Uh, again, they don't want all the exposure to Taiwan or Korea or China. Apple is bringing production to India and so forth. So in this world, in a different world where one superpower was promoting and kind of protecting free trade all over the world, you could be tiny Singapore and do very well. You might still do very well as a tiny Singapore going forward because the rest of the region is becoming rich. Uh, but now scale matters. So what I mean by that is if Bangladesh today adopts the policy, and Bangladesh is quite a big country actually, 140, 50 million people, but in, in, it's about 10 times smaller than India, right? If Bangladesh adopts a PLI policy or a policy of very moderate tariffs, I mean, it, Indian current industrial trade policy is very separate from what Nehruji did 30, 40, 50 years ago, or Nehruvians did. Uh, so we are not against FIA, we are not against foreign companies manufacturing here, we just want them to manufacture here. We are not throwing out Pepsi and Coca-Cola, we are saying so long as you manufacture here, it's fine. So if, if, if Bangladesh or somebody even smaller, say Nepal, said you, we have these tariffs, we have these PLIs, uh, you don't have zero duty access, uh, take it or leave it. So maybe Apple and Samsung would say, okay, fine, we leave it, right? But they can't say that to India. It's the only large growing market. So scale allows us to do many other things, which I'll come to. And finally, innovation. The reason I use the word innovation and not technology is because technology sounds exogenous. Techno te technology sounds like you know somebody who is we are copy pasting stuff from outside. I think uh, there is an element of that, but I think innovation is also endogenous. Innovation also means what we are developing here locally in terms of R and D. Uh, and that's very important for in terms of both digitalization, but also green and clean technology, and I'll come to that. Why is that important? So these are the broad three pillars, and I want to speak on each of these for five, seven minutes. So first of all, democracy is also linked to geopolitics, right? Uh, to some extent, in, during the Cold War, when the Americans decided under Kissinger, and can you have less noise there, please, if you don't mind? Okay, so, so during the Cold War, during when President Nixon was there, he famously reached out to China to uh, isolate the Soviet Union. And the Chinese basically used that opening to become rich for the next 40 years. In a way, India is trying to do that right now against China. But in India, there is an additional benefit that, you know, what happened after happened of the Ukraine war was Russia became uninvestable. Like Russian foreign exchange reserves were seized by the Europeans and Americans. Uh, Russian, ET, Russian markets were closed for global ETFs. I'm not here to discuss what is fair or not fair. I'm simply here to discuss what it means for India. Uh, a lot of people are now very worried what happens in Taiwan and China becomes uninvestable. Right? So last year there was a lot of money leaving China because of that along with the zero COVID policy. In the short term we are seeing right now the Chinese have reopened, therefore a lot of money is going there. But China remains a trade, it does not remain an investment. Right? Everybody is very scared of putting long-term money anymore in China now because they are not sure what happens politically. In India, along with the geopolitics, the democracy allows them, uh, allows foreign investors to be more comfortable investing money here. Which is also one of the reasons within the West, people who dislike India, for whatever reason, have a vested interest to constantly doubt India's credentials as a democracy. Right? If, you, if, you, if you notice, op-eds in the Washington Post, etc., they're all or these, these uh, crazily in, inaccurate and made-up indices like VDEM, etc., where they're trying to show that India is not a democracy. So within the West, there is also an internal debate and fight over how to approach India. But as of now, they have no other alternative but to have India in their, they think, in their camp against communist China. 
So that the, now let's come to scale. Now, why is scale, uh, besides the trade policy example which I gave you in PLI, why is that so important? Uh, so, you know, what is a, the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, right? What, what does the reserve currency mean? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, reserve currency is partially that. I mean, technically, the reserve currency means people, other people's central banks want to have your currency in their central bank as insurance, as, a as, a, as part of their basket. So, so around the, the biggest reserve currency in the world is US dollar, number two is euro, number three is the yen, and number four is the pound, and then there is a bit of the Chinese renminbi, there is the Canadian Australian dollars, and there's also a bit of the Swiss franc. But by the big three in descending order are the US dollar, euro, and yen. Now, how big is the Japanese economy? It's around four and a half trillion dollars. Uh, so even though the yen got, it went to 150 to the dollar, it's right, 130 to the dollar right now, it's around four and a half, actually less, 4.3, 4.4 trillion dollars. Uh, it's number four. Where's the number three? Number four is Germany. Uh, how big is the Indian economy right now? Yes, almost three and a half. So we, we know that the distance between the Indian economy and the Japanese economy, uh, and beach there is Germany, uh, so Indian economy and the Japanese German economy is not much. It's either one or two years, maybe three years at most, right? Depends how the currency fluctuates. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio. So Japan has a debt to GDP ratio of say 200%, India has 80-90%. So why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because there's an old joke that uh, if you owe the bank a million dollars, uh, you are in trouble. If you owe the bank a billion dollars, the bank is in trouble. Right? What does that mean? It means that actually if you have a very large debt, and obviously what is debt? Debt is country's GDP multiplied by debt to GDP, right? If you have a very large debt pool, sovereign debt pool, then actually liquidity starts coming into that pool. And your currency automatically starts becoming what is known as hard. So, so a hard currency is the prerequisite to being a reserve currency. Not all hard currencies are reserve currencies, but hard currencies are generally in which you end up opening your capital account, other people can buy financial assets, people in the country can send out money. Right now we can't fully, right? Right now there's a liberalized remittance scheme, there's a limitation of $250,000 per person per year, etc., etc. And in this budget there was a TCS that was applied on this. So, so India is, whether it's two years, five years, ten years, it's at most five to ten years away from a position where the Indian rupee will, by the virtue of its size, start becoming a hard currency. This is a very unique situation because generally countries have hard currencies when they become relatively richer on a per capita basis. In India it's unique because in India we are large population, uh, excuse me, with a relatively lower per capita income. Uh, so you would say, okay, what about the Chinese? The Chinese are halfway there. Like, as I said, the renminbi is in there, is in the global reserves. But one of the reasons the Chinese are halfway there, despite being uh, right now in $18 trillion GDP, as compared to America's $25 trillion, is because the Chinese being a geopolitical foe of the broader West, which means the US, Europe, Japan, and now India is I wouldn't call it an honorary member. India is something more special and bigger than that, but India is definitely in the counter-China alliance, right? The Quad is nothing but that. So the Chinese thought around 2015 to open the capital account, but they've never been able to get there. So they got a lot of flows in their bond. They, they entered the three bond indices, which India has still not, by the way. Uh, they got a lot of money. They lost a lot of money last year. They're getting some inflows. But the Chinese will never be able to have a fully open account as of now yet, uh, because the investors quite don't know when suddenly there'll be a rupture between the two systems. And people often say that there is a lot of mutual dependence between America and China, there is to some extent, but they overstate the case. The Chinese depend on the Americans for a market. And people used to say America depends on Chinese for buying their bonds. But that is not the case. You know, if somebody, so let's say there are $500 billion bonds, that's actually more, that the Chinese own in US treasuries. Tomorrow the US treasury just needs to do one thing, it needs to say, delete, 
and just print $500 billion and buy. It wouldn't make any difference. Like, US treasuries are IOUs that the US government issues. That's the whole point of a fiat currency. That if tomorrow there is a war, or whatever extremely heightened tensions, the US Treasury can simply say, like they did with Russia, that your reserves, your holdings of our government assets are no longer valid. And if you think, therefore, there'll be lack of liquidity, just that, they can just print that much. So it's not equally as interdependent as it sounds. The US has an upper hand, because ultimately the Chinese are exchanging real goods that they are manufacturing for American paper or American promises, right? So there is, a, there is a bit of a difference. So there is, the Americans sometimes pretend that, oh my God, there is such a, such a big burden we have in issuing the world's reserve currency, etc. No, it's a real privilege. And countries which have it, they don't want to let go of it. So, in a, so the Chinese case is unique, it's halfway there. But if you take out China, uh, who's next? Europe. Europe is there, but it's, it's not quite fully there in the sense that it's not one country yet. Right? So the German 10-year yield trades at a different percentage from the French 10-year yield, which trades differently from the Italian 10-year yield, which is much higher because it's considered more likely to default, etc., etc. So the point there is, um, in the case of both China and Europe, there are issues which they cannot fully replace the US dollar. Next comes Japan. Japan, obviously, as I said, we are likely to overtake in a couple of years. So the only large democratic united country in the next 10, 12 years which can approach a reasonable size fraction of the US debt markets is India. And that is, in that sense, is underappreciated right now. Because if you look at the 10Y yield of Israel, it went from like 7% to 1% in 10 years. Same for Thailand. So, in often there are many uh, countries in which there is a transition. Suddenly they go from high cost of capital to low cost of capital. And the things that the Indian government and the Indian, Indian private sector can do with relatively low cost of capital are huge. So that's the, so along with trade policy, industrial policy and financial policy, what is another aspect of scale? One huge aspect of scale obviously is demographics. Right? Demographics you've all heard multiple times demographic dividend hai, a demographic disaster hai. So demographics, the term to understand in demographics is demographic transition. What does that mean? It means that, you know, as modernity came and we had more medicines, so people lived longer and less children thankfully died after birth. So there was a transition period. So initially couples or parents would do a very rough, it sounds uh, horrible to say it, put it that way, but say 50, 70, 100 years ago, that if you have four children, roughly two will survive, yeah. right? It it, it, so, I mean, of course, nobody likes to put it that way, but that was the rough calculation. Um, then, of course, there's a transition where you have all, a lot of the communicable disease being reduced. People see, oh my God, if you have four children, actually three or in most cases four survive, uh, thankfully. And therefore, the next generation says, maybe we don't need to have four, right? You go to two, then of course, women get educated and start working, thankfully, once again and then there is a higher opportunity cost. So there is a it's, a, it's a classic demographic transition and India is not unique. There are other factors, psychological, religious, etc. but economics is also a very important part of it. So India is in the demographic transition whereby if you take the 25 to 65 age group as a rough working age population or potential working age population uh, and divide that by the total population, right? So if you, if you want in purely economic terms this thing to be higher compared to the overall population base. I mean, I'm saying oh, pure, purely economics, there are other aspects, of course, a civilization has to continue reproduce, there are political aspect, aspects as well. So this work dependency ratio, in a way, was the worst in 1970s, and it has been improving since then. So since then, the percentage of population that's between 25 to 65, every year is higher uh, compared to the last year, since the mid-1970s. That's also the time when the Chinese dependency ratio actually was bottomed out. But the difference is the Chinese dependency ratio then peaked in 2015. So the 25 to 65 population, of course, before the 1970s, they had many more kids relatively. Now the Chinese have relatively more old people. The Indian demographic transition is much slower. So it, will, it has probably another 20 to 25 years. So let's say if it ends roughly around 2047, 
the Chinese roughly ended around 2015. I'm just symbolically taking whole numbers here. So there is a th there's a 30, 32 year gap, there's slightly more than a generation gap. So which is why, which there are many other policies to discuss, but we should not be surprised that the Chinese growth rate was slightly faster because their demographic transition was sharper. So what happens in a demographic transition obviously is, you know, there are more people uh, working, more people having less children, and uh, there, which creates future problems. But for the next 20, 30 years, it looks very nice in terms of numbers. So India is right now going through that slightly slower phase of what the Chinese have just concluded around seven or eight years ago. And if you look at the Indian GDP per capita growth rate, real GDP per capita growth rate, moving average since the 1970s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, it's beautiful how the number is just uh, every 10 years it goes up by one percentage point. So just before COVID, it was around six percentage. So 6% real GDP per capita growth rate. Uh, 10 years before, it was roughly 5. So around 2009, 2000, around 1999, it was roughly 4. So because of India's sheer scale, size, and heterogeneity, uh, one interesting aspect is our statistics tend to be relatively smooth in, compared to smaller countries. Like if you look for Bulgaria or Romania, like the numbers are just all over. You can go to World Bank, you can go to Federal Reserve numbers, IMF numbers. A lot of this data is available in the public domain. So in India, just by the continuing that aspect, it should be around 7% 7, 7 GDP growth rate on a per capita basis, right? Of course, there's no reason to linearly extrapolate, but there is also no reason not to linearly extrapolate. And I'll come to some of the underlying growth factors. So if it is, so just to do the math there, if India uh, per capita GDP grows at 7%, uh, you, know, you know, some of you know the rule of 17 compounding, right? So it should double in 10 years. Anything that grows at around 7% roughly doubles in 10 years. So I think somebody got very excited with India's growth rate. <laughs> so, uh, so something that doubles for four decades, how much does it become? Ev doubles every decade for four decades. 16 times. Right? So if you, do, if you just do the rough math, even if you don't increase further, but you don't slow down further also, in four decades, if India's GDP per capita roughly grows at the, the current trajectory without further acceleration, and the US grows at the, its current trajectory of around between 1.8 to 2%. So not the Chinese, I'm talking about the US. In four decades, the Indian and US trajectory meet in 40 years, that's, that's more than a generation, but less than two generations. But if you just do that number based on $2,500, it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, wait a second, even if it, even $2,500 goes up 16 times, it's only $40,000. And America is further increasing from $75,000. How, how, how is Harsh saying they meet? They meet because the currency also appreciates. So I'm talking in real terms right now. So, the, so when a country which is poorer grows very rapidly, then over time, its currency appreciates. And it happens, so there's a lot of cycles, it's difficult to see in the short run, but this effect is known as Balasa Samuelson effect. In fact, Jagdish Bhagwati, who's an Indian economist in Colombia, also had a different take on the same phenomenon. Sometimes it's also called the Balasa Samuelson Bhagwati effect. Uh, so if you take that idea, the reason I'm saying is, the $10,000 per capita income already has the PPP adjustment made in India, right? So if you do it from the basis of that, that factor of four, which is the current ratio, by definition when we converge, there is no PPP difference. That kicks in. So which is why whenever you want to do a simple calculation on your calculator or Google, please remember that there is inflation and there is a real appreciation. And that is why the India story is stronger than it might appear based on some simple math. Uh, then innovation. So now, okay, you say, Harsh, all this is numbers, but what are the real reasons why we should grow? So the real reasons, as I said, along with demographics and de democracy, the real reason, obviously, is innovation. So in COVID, obviously, there's a lot of health, personal loss, financial loss short term. But how many of you were using Skype for relatives or you know, in America or some other city in India around 10 years ago? Almost all of you were using Skype earlier, right? Five, seven years ago. But were you using video chat for business purposes five, ten years ago? 
No. The technology is already there. The technology was already there. I mean, in fact, I used to work in London for a consulting firm, and we also had the software, but for some reason it was just considered taboo. You pick up the phone or speaker, you'll go and meet. Because if you're somehow doing a video chat, it just seemed less professional. Obviously, the pandemic completely changed that, right? Now, it's, now Zoom is a thing, and people doing silly things, forgetting they're online on Zoom is, there are so many memes online and WhatsApp, etc. So Zoom became a real thing. Now Zoom or Microsoft Office, whatever we want to call it, whatever software you're using it. So wh why does that matter? A lot of people in the US in high, relatively high cost cities like New York and SF, they started going to relatively low cost cities in the US like Austin or uh, parts of Florida, etc. But, but then the logical next question is if you can, you know, if you're doing from Boston to Austin, you can go from Boston to Pune also. So in a way, what that has happened is it has given, in the, and actually it's already started to show in our services exports data, not overall exports data, services exports data, that Indian services have received a third round, a third boost of offshoring has been received. So now what's happening is not just coming through technology companies like Infosys, Wipro. A lot of them are forming what is known as GCCs, Global Capability Centers, or Global In-House Centers, or R&D Centers. Any multinational worth its salt increasingly has a 500, 200, 1,000 member office or multiple offices in Bangalore first and foremost, but also Pune, Hyderabad, Gurgaon, Noida, etc. Because for $10,000 in India, you can get a relatively good engineer fresh off the boat, uh, fresh off college, but for $10,000, you might not even get somebody in New York for one month. Right? It's just the cost of living is insanely different. It's not the person there is necessarily greedy or anything. So the arbitrage is huge and in fact right now macroeconomic moves in cycles right now we are at the end of a strong dollar cycle so right now it e seems even more so the dollar roughly goes in eight ten year cycles 2002 was the last time uh, the dollar was very strong 2011 was when it bottomed out after a brief spike during the global financial crisis and it was about to peak when COVID happened and therefore the peak kind of delayed by another couple of, it basically seems to have peaked last September, uh, something known as dollar index reached 114, and it, it seems to have peaked last September, we'll see. So, the do, so along with the uh, underlying factors, there is a massive arbitrage to be done, and the education here in India, skill and talent, increasingly more and more people coming, you can always say there is an element of quality uh, which can be improved, but the relatively good English speaking, hard working people, it's just a no-brainer. Nobody else in the world uh, where you can go. I mean, you can go to Philippines to get some, Poland to get some, but just the depth of talent here is huge. And all the people who are entering these entry-level jobs, they will be the mid-level management in five years, and many of them will be top and high-level management in 15 years. Because if, you, uh, and you know, you, anecdotally, you might have friends or relatives or cousins who joined some multinational in Bangalore in their office. After five, seven years, they got posted to their US or UK office, right? Sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanent shift happened. Because it is, talent is talent. Once you're within the ecosystem, then it comes down to talent. Um, so I think this, this is important to understand. So now why does that relate to technology? In India, we have the world's cheapest data and increasingly good speeds also. Uh, it happened because of government policy. It happened because of large corporates like Geo, et cetera, which, ancient, which entered. And unlike 2G, 3G, and 4G, where we were always many years behind, in the case of 5G, we are roughly co-equal. We're still slightly behind, but in 5G, which will require much more capex, India is entering. So you don't have to believe in metaverse and virtual reality, but basic good quality Skype, good quality video chatting. Can you just imagine if you can have a yoga teacher in Bombay teaching uh, yoga to millennials in Manhattan, right? And often even here right now, you somebody's doing uh, yoga and you just put the phone on or put the screen on and you follow it, right? So if, if it's the person is not physically there, how does it matter whether they're halfway across the world? The, the, the real outsourcing drama will actually happen on services and not on manufacturing. So uh, there'll be a lot of political push and that we haven't seen anything yet. So that's on the data side. Now the most important element is yet to come, which is on the energy side. What is India's biggest macroeconomic weakness? Oil. Oil. So whenever we start growing fast, and the world economy is also doing well, and our exports are doing well. I mean, like oil has crossed hundred dollars. Our trade deficit has gone to this. Our current account deficit has gone to this. 
And unlike many other economies, we hardly produce any oil. I think around 85 to 90% of the crude we have is imported. Now, it is true that some of it is re-exported. You know, our, we have a very good refinery uh, capacity in India. And we do hard distillation. Uh, so a lot of it is re-exported. But bulk of it is still used for domestic purposes, and except Bombay, High, and parts of Assam. And now I think Vedanta Group is trying something in Rajasthan. We really don't have, so far, domestic sources of crude. So for India to get off oil is not just about climate change. It is about that too. It is about climate change. It is about cities being less polluted. All that is very important. It is a purely strategic, economic, and technological decision as well. Which is why you are seeing the Prime Minister and the government down, along with the large conglomerates, all talking about green hydrogen, all talking about electric vehicles, incentives, making everything green. It's not just about ESG. It's not just about getting global money. It is. India cannot grow to the next rung, uh, constantly importing 90% of its energy. Remember, because just in one Permian basin in the US, they might produce 5 million barrels of day of oil easily, which is all of what India imports every day right now. So it's like saying, if India had that one Permian oil basin, shale basin in India, all of India's oil imports would not be there. So do you? So gradually, what we are seeing is, in the long run, natural resources will become less important the human mind will become more important. But that is over the long run. The transition period is very painful. Uh, Mayur, how much time I have left just to roughly, I have much to say, but I just want to make sure I pace it well. OK, another five minutes. So, so oil is there. What is happening in terms of, it does not mean that our oil imports will come down tomorrow. It means as a percentage of GDP, it will slow down. We will still have oil. Oil is required, by the way, not just for energy. It's required for plastics. It's required for pharma. It's required for many downstream products. Crude is required for everything. But in India, over and above any domestic new sources that we may or may not find, uh, this energy transition in India is extremely important for us in that region. Uh, on the final point, of in which com combines innovation, scale, and democracy, the three points, is on the financial system. See, the Americans, what is Anglo-American has a very equity-based model. Uh, whereas the continental European model or the Japanese or South Korean model was very bank-heavy. India is somewhere in between. So we actually have very remarkably developed equity markets. I will partially and uh, respectfully disagree with the last speaker. I think derivatives are very important for any functioning uh, capital market. Um, in fact, India has some of the world's most regulated markets. What has happened in the recent episode uh, is not a lesson to ban derivatives. It's a, best, it's a lesson to make sure that short selling or people who write short selling reports in India uh, don't feel afraid. In markets, if you are going to become one of the world's three largest economies in the next five years, then other people will be interested in your markets. Whether or not they have other sinister agendas is a separate point. But if, if something is overvalued, I'm not talking about fraud. That, that is beyond my pale. That's for regulators. But it is, no, it is undoubtedly true that the group that we are talking about, the stocks were extremely overvalued. Right? If the stocks are extremely overvalued, then somebody wa will somewhere want to short it. And if you allow it to be short, it will, it will short earlier at a lower price. Otherwise, uh, somebody else will do it at a higher price. And uh, so if any retail investors who are retail speculators uh, should not complain after making a lot of money on that. So it's very easy to play victim. I'm sorry to be blunt. Uh, so you are a retail speculator and trader. Once you lose money, then you become an investor. Because then you want to hold until the price is recovered. So, so, so let us not fool anybody, most importantly ourselves. Uh, the financial market in India is extremely important, not just on debt and equity, and debt is relatively less developed. But what has happened in the last few years, and right now, this year is a bit of a slow, slow year, we have had a massive PEVC boom in India. And suddenly, entrepreneurship in India has been democratized. So what, again, what do I mean by scale? I, what I mean by scale is, if you're a very smart young person in Brazil, or Brazil is still halfway there, but let's say, when, uh, let's say Argentina, let's say even, uh, even some country in Europe, Poland, right? Uh, a good relative economy, but relatively small economy, you psychologically want to be in the center of the universe in the US. Right? But, so there, are, there can be only so many poles in the world. One is clearly the US, one is China. The India is coming as a third pole. So there are very smart people who can easily work abroad, earn much more money in the short term, but who want to stay here and take risk. 
over and above reasons of family, emotions, patriotism, that is separate, that is also there. And that to me is a very good sign that the Indian elite of the elite, creme de la creme, unlike aspects of the Chinese elite, especially on the political corrupt side, are, despite the headlines you see, and the numbers are sometimes wrong because of the pandemic, there was a short run and then people left. Large number, if you go to the IITs, if you go to IIMs, large number of the Indian elites are still wanting to be in India. And that is a good sign because even though the per capita income is slow but rising rapidly, because of the sheer number of population, this jam trinity, this uh, digitalization, this digital public goods that we have, and which we are the world's best by far, you can suddenly enter a market. I know, uh, you know people who are making mini Ramayans for children, and they can get paid on Instagram via UPI instantly. That, and then they can instantly uh, sell it by post. That kind of plug and play ecosystem was not there till even five years ago. And all the villages today have pakka roads, they have bijli, they have sanitation. So what you're seeing is people who were literally living in their village till about 10, 15 years ago, they are suddenly not just part of the Indian economy, they're part of the global economy. Because you can now actually live in that village and you can do, for example, teach yoga to somebody in Manhattan. That plug and play, the way you get money, financing, everything, those pipelines have been laid. So therefore, the big question is if there is going to be convergence. Historically, this, is a, this divergence is very anomalous. Most large parts of the world roughly have the same per capita of income, maybe two times more, two times less. 20, 30 times, 100 times more or less was extremely anomalous. So in that case, if there is going to be broadly convergence with good governance, India has to be one of the world's largest economies, if not the world's largest economy. I have said it will be the world's largest economy by 2047 as per my calculations. We will see. Uh, it, it becomes very, in that particular sense, it becomes a pole in which not only Indian diaspora wants to come back at least for some time, but talent from around the world, or at least the region would also want to start coming here. And eventually, in the next 10, 20 years, it will become a talent competition as demographics change in the world. Right now, people don't want immigrants. There's, there's too much confusion between refugees, illegal immigrants, blue-collar immigrants, white-collar immigrants. But for white-collar immigrants especially, in the next 10 years, you'll see there'll be a massive competition. And one of the things India has to do is make sure we don't lose too much talent. It doesn't seem like that if it grows rapidly, but that's the point I like to end on. As you think about 2047, we can have some questions now. Thank you so much. Up here, Raji. No, no, please. Sit. No, no, please, please sit. Akele bed ke lag raha hai ki mera idhar wo kacha na koi case chal raha hai. Hashji, you said that uh, you know uh, China benefited from a rapid transformation in age. I would think partially because of their communist autocratic system versus our uh, democratic system. Would you agree with that uh, point of view? No, I absolutely agree. So this is why I think democracy is better because you don't build a bridge in one year, but then you don't destroy societies also in five years. Your both positive and negative steps are not so extreme. So what the Chinese did in the 70s is exactly what Sanjay Gandhi wanted to do. That was Sanjay Gandhi's grand plan. Sabki ja ke nas bandi kar do. Like, the Chinese were absolutely sure they were doing the right thing. And now they have reversed And now they've, I think a few years ago they allowed two child, yeah. then three child, and now they've gone to any number of children. And in fact, now they're starting to give incentives. But you just, you know, once the toothpaste comes out of the, it, it can't be put back in. You can't suddenly tell people now, okay, your mom had, one kid, now you go back and have four kids. It doesn't work culturally that way. So uh, I think uh, the, our system is a system that in the short run neither overly disappoints nor overly surprises. But that stability, see the Chinese, just to take a number, the Chinese hardly have a PE ratio of 10. I'm just making a broad number. The Indian PE ratio is very high. Because there is a very state-dominated model, SOEs, what we call PSUs, they call SOEs, state-owned enterprises. Uh, so they have a political dictate, this must be done. You know, profitability goes to hell. So another way to call it is financial repression. Whereas in India, because it's still private sector-led, here the average entrepreneur has a very deep appreciation of the efficiency of capital. 
So ROE and ROCEs are much better in India. In fact, in World Bank rankings, speaking of the recent episode, people are like, Indian, Indian markets are so, in fact, they've done very well in this episode. The, there has been no broader contagion. Uh, on ease of doing business, you know, under uh, Prime Minister Modi, we've gone from, I don't know, 100 something to 60, they improved dramatically. In 2020, the rankings were stopped during the pandemic and there was some bias of the Chinese manipulating it, so it was stopped after many years. But one of the indicators on which India was very strong was respecting minority right investors. I think we were on the 13th or something in that. Very high, fifth or something, very high number. And that is because, uh, I mean, I think we were talking about ASBA, uh, Devanji had mentioned about that idea. I mean, other countries are nowhere even close to that. For example, we have CDSL, NSDL, right? Your stock goes and is kept in a stock depository. Absolutely. In the US, the brokers keep your stocks. They call it the street. The, the street keeps the street it. Keeps and there is something called a FINRA kind of insurance like FIDC. So if, if they go broke up to up $5,000 or something, they cover you. After that, Bhagavan Malik is. <laughs> Whereas in this case, you know, the brokers here are supposed to be thin. They're thin layer. They're just supposed to be transition mediums. I mean, some people are joking in 10 years, NSE, BSE might just have their own retail brokerage. I mean, it won't happen. But I'm just saying, we are trying to basically make the retail brokerage as thin as possible in India. The online discount retail brokerage model. Everything goes directly to depository, to some regulated entity, so that you can rest easy. So in that sense, I think uh, this episode has shown the credibility of Indian markets compared to Chinese and other markets. The same thing applies to our... Uh uh, accounting uh, disclosures also. India, uh, you know, has one of the best accounting disclosures and even for private limited companies, you have to disclose moments of equity capital. So this is a myth that US is number one in disclosure. No, I, I think the, so I, I sometimes disagree with what SEBI and RBI does, but I think on the whole, we must congratulate, especially SEBI, for having an extremely well-regulated equity markets in India, um, you know, I mean, many of you, again, people older would remember, but I am only on the basis of, I've spoken to people, all these scams that happened around 30 years ago. Now it's almost impossible to do. Right? It is, everything is electronic, everything, there is, a, there, is a, there is a paper receipt, paper trail of it. How do you do remotely what was done earlier? And, uh, you know, that, I mean, in fact, just, I think recently only, uh, last week in the US, there was a software uh, system outage that the derivative trades being settled had to be done manually. This just happened last week. Uh, so, so sometimes the Indian system is a bit too small c conservative, but I think especially in matters of high-end finance, uh, it's important to make it as much exchange traded possible, have as much margin as possible, be on the safe side. But that does not mean ban the market. Just have as much disclosure as possible. Um, you know, Warren Buffett famously called derivatives weapons of mass destruction, but he himself used it. So, you know, there is always see people's karni and not katni. And I think that's very important. Harsh, now Amrit Kal and all that is being celebrated for the 25 years. Modi ji has got limited life. I hope he survives for such a long time. Now, how our economy is dependent on the political situation in the country? Because earlier they were talking about Hindu rate of growth. Now we are talking about American rate of growth. Now tomorrow, for any reason, if the government changes after five years, will the momentum of rise of India will continue? Or it is now insulated from political parties coming in power? Thank you so much. That's an excellent question. I think, first of all, what we have now and what we'll have is that will be the real Hindu rate of growth. So what we had was a socialist rate of growth. So, so let us be very clear. What we have now will be the Hindu capitalist rate of growth. Um, I think it's a very good question. There are multiple views of history. One is the great man view of history. One is the kind of structural forces view of history. So both matter. I think individuals, small minorities and elites, selflessly working hard matters. I think broader forces also matter. What do I mean by that? Uh, somebody like Rakesh Junjunwala ji, even during the worst years of UPA2 when there's a lot of corruption, he was very bullish. Why was he bullish? Because structurally the Indian democracy was still sound. Which is why I often say that the real turning point in Indian economic history was not 1991. It was 1977. 1977 showed 
that no matter what happens, the Indian democracy will survive. And what is democracy? Democracy is basically saying, if I don't like the bugger, I can vote him out. That's what democracy means. So why that is a structural meta reason? If you look broadly in India, with urbanization, with uh, salience of language, region, and caste becoming less important, with elections increasingly giving a clear victor, both at the general level and the state level, whether it's BJP or non-BJP. What is happening is, earlier, uh, cephologists used to say that Indian elections are only a combination of local factors. But that is clearly no longer true. There is, there is a sense, because of technology, because of social media, because of aspirations become, becoming higher and relatively equal, because a greater sense of how all of us think about each other, Right? I can go from Calcutta to Mumbai to Bangalore and it does not seem a radically different country. 20, 30 years ago, somebody might say, oh, North Indian aya hai, bhoat zor se music baja raha, usko band karo. Right? That, that kind of stuff is now reduced. That is still there. And vice versa. I mean, again, there was bias and prejudice from all sides and there still exists. It is reducing. There is more intermarriage. There's a, there is a broad Hindu, Indic, Dharmic identity which is coming which is underlaying the political foundations of the country. What, what I mean by that is, of course, Prime Minister Modi is a once-in-a-century political phenomenon. right? He has accelerated a lot of the trends, but the trends were there already. And it is therefore after him, you know, people used to say after Nehru who. So even after Narendra Modi ji, there will the broad trend of prosperity creating more harmony in society, more oneness in thinking about the nation's future, in turn leading to better, inf for example, this budget had so much uh, outlay on infrastructure, I think Devinji also mentioned it. Why do you think that's the case? That's the case because this government is relatively politically confident. Right? We all, infrastructure is a classic case of short term pain, long term gain. Right? If you have a Mumbai metro being made in Kolaba and Kaf Parade, it is really painful for 5-7 years. As it is the roads are very thin, then also half the road gets blocked for metro. Right? It's a classic case of short-term pain, long-term gain. But today the country understands there is more literacy and awareness. More people are saying, okay, we'll take the pain because it's good for the country over the long run. That aspiration, that politicization in the national sense is new and there is a virtuous cycle. The richer you get, more people are more educated and thinking as a national elite. Earlier the national elite was very thin, the IAS officers. Usse pehle ICS officers during British Raj. Even before that, they were the, the, the pundits and Brahmins and Shastris of the country. They kept the civilization combined, right? So you would go from Kashi to Uttar Kashi to Tenkasi or whatever. So now that broad Indianness, that pride in a civilization is much more broad based. Therefore, even if some other party or person comes to power, he or she will have to play to this constituency. In that sense, uh, civilizational pride and economic development go together which is beyond any one person or party in the long run. Of course, in the short run and uh, medium term, there can be setbacks. Uh, I would like to add to what he said, and Raviji, to answer your question. Whether this trend continues or not is really in our hands. And I'm pausing here deliberately, because on the voting day, if you go and vote sanely in the same fashion, same trend, this trend, trend will stay not for 25 years, but for the next 100 years. All this has happened, all this has happened because we didn't go and vote, and we were going to Lonawala. Uh, with, with this, uh, does anybody have any more questions, please? Uh, do we have, do we have a mic? Yes. India enjoys the best demographic. Uh, uh, we have people between the age of 18 to 32. If we don't take advantage of it, by the year 2047, we would have wasted it. Yes. So we need employment first, and employable as well as kid. Those are the very important. I fully agree. I think your second point, tha, the second reference, employability is more important. What I mean by that is, see, in terms of political speeches, it's very important and understandable to talk of employment. But governments don't create employment. Markets do. So it's, what is important is you create the supply of human quality, human capital, quality human capital. The markets will do the rest in this kind of situation, global connected situation that I talked about. So we are already seeing that. 
So for example, below the age of 25, there is near 95% plus literacy, if I'm not wrong. And not only is it 95% literacy, it's equal for men and women, boys and girls, roughly now. For, for uh, primary and secondary schools, it's almost 100% enrollment. For higher secondary, there is still some drop-off rates. Uh, there's a lot of work being done, especially on female toilets, on better roads, and safety, better teachers, etc. But this is a remarkable transition that's happened. Uh, in many, especially in some states are relatively backward, like Rajasthan till, till 20 years ago, suddenly there's a huge improvement across parties. And therefore the human capital is coming, the pipelines of connecting them to the global market are there, and I, saw, I see no reason why uh, they will not be used. The upsurge will take care of itself. We have to focus on the basics, including human capital. Quality is a real issue. Some education reforms can be done. The NEP is the first step. Teacher unions are a problem in terms of efficiency of outlays, but never mind. Uh, broadly, the demographic upsurge is not just there in numbers, it's also there in quality. And therefore, your point is very well taken. Uh, but it's also why I don't think it will be wasted. And also these uh, national skill development programs uh, that are uh, being rolled out is also going to have an uh, impact on the kind of uh, students you are going to come into the job market because they will become employable, isn't it? Absolutely, and a lot of the employment actually happens, a lot of the actual human capital accretion happens on the job training. So the fact that we have increasingly so many white collar entry level jobs, uh, which some people may not want, uh, but a lot of people do, is actually very good for the long term uh, trend of the country. One thing I'll quickly add there is, on the, on the so called vocational training and blue collar, there is an element of, uh, unfortunately, some prejudice that people don't want to enter that. The vocational training is seen as wrong in some cases. And I think so long as it depends on the individual, and you don't, it does not depend on the community, it depends on the individual, we should also be open to good vocational training in so-called blue collar jobs. Because you know, there are many people in developed countries who have a very good uh, living standard with just blue collar jobs. So in the long run, we cannot let go of that. But yes, a large part of that will be automated. Not all of it though. The question is, you know, that there's a world shortage of nurses, and I'm glad that this yes. budget is talking of 137. Japan needs a lot of nurses, but there's a question Yeah, of so it's not just nurses, uh, and uh, languages. Yeah. Yes, a lot of language actually will help with technology, automatic translation. In the 25 to 65 category, which I mentioned, I think India will create around 200 million more people in that category, and China will reduce by 150 million in that category. And Europe and Japan is already even worse. Uh, the US is relatively okay, but that's only because of immigration, uh, not because of the native birth rate. So India is going to be the major export of labor, whether it happens directly or it happens through offshoring of services. So direct or indirect, this is the only major game in town. We have two questions. Space, please. Yeah. So good evening. My name is Kranti Sagar. I'm doing PhD on vitamin D3. And from the institute PhD on what? Vitamin D3. So my question is, what will be the Indian economy in terms of trillion dollar in 2047? And second question is, how <coughs> global recession will hit the Indian economy in terms of food, energy, or inflation? So on the on the first question, in terms of 2047, yeah, I would say we should not think in terms of dollars; we should think in terms of rupees. Right. Because if you're going to be the world's leading economy your country's currency will become the hard currency, reserve currency, or at least one of the two hard reserve currencies. But your question is very well taken that in terms of intermediate dates, so I've written that actually by if FY25, maybe a few months later, we will actually still hit 5 trillion, because in the short term, I'm actually very bullish on the rupee. I think the dollar is kind of peaked out, but anyway, let's see whether that happens or not. In terms of FY31 or end of 2030, I think we could hit about 12 trillion dollars. But I think starting mid 30s, to think in terms of dollars then becomes pointless because you become one of the world's hard currencies. Uh, and therefore the volatility to that extent is a bit different. I think in terms of the global impact, yes, there's no real decoupling, the, all the world is one economy. Um, but, uh, so there is, the, the short term correlation will be there, but I think the long term trend is very clear in case of India. Um, so what has happened is 2002 to 2011, I said was a kind of weak dollar phase, therefore good for emerging markets. 2011 to roughly last year or end of, beginning this year, end of last year was 
bad for emerging markets, relatively good for the US markets, especially tech stocks. So those are cycles. But India actually already has been one of the world's best performers in market returns for the last 25 years by far. Because it is when the global markets do very well, oil prices go up, India does not do that well. For example, as well as Brazil or Indonesia. But when they go down, they get all uh, suddenly down because they're commodity exporters. India has a net upturn. Buffet. So India is very stable in that sense, remarkably. At least in rupee terms. Dollar terms, there is still a cycle. It's good for a defensive bet. That it's a very good, it's a low beta bet in that sense. Uh, and good, good diversification for a global investor. <coughs> My name is Chandrasekhar. With the kind of uh, growth project, uh, do you think there any consolidation among all the SARC countries and a common currency for them? Is there a possibility there? So I think it's an excellent question. I think maybe, uh, I mean, see, right now Nepal and Bhutan's currencies are already de facto linked to India. Um, I think Nepal is 1.6 and Bhutan is 1 is to 1. So they're already linked. So if, you, if your currency is linked to India, your monetary policy is effectively linked to India's monetary policy. Now the question is, does it become a larger economic integrated area? You're absolutely right. So what the Chinese do very well, and the earlier Americans, is what some people now call geoeconomics. They don't call it geopolitics, they call it geoeconomics. So what I mean by that is, if you become a 10, 20 trillion dollar GDP here, and uh, others plug and play in it, then for, in a way, benign or not so benign, uh, they become dependent on you, because if you cut them off, it will hurt you, but it will not hurt you remotely as much as it will hurt them. So this is, this is what the Chinese do with the South Koreans. When they're unhappy, they cut off their exports, they cut off the tourists, or with Japan also to some extent. Not to mention smaller countries. Recently, they banned Australian wine and Australian coal. The coal they've just restarted right now. So I think there'll be a lot of... India will become... It's like gravitational pull, right? You know, at a, at a very medium-sized Newtonian physics supplies, very small quantum applies, but at very high uh, gravitational pull and mass, you know, uh, relativity starts applying. So uh, space and time gets warped. So in India, in Indian case, that is what will lead to a lot of, so without getting into too much details, I absolutely agree, whether or not it's formally a common market, de facto it will become a common market. Whether or not it's formally a common currency, de facto it will be linked currencies. Uh, and that the sheer economic gravity of that actually becomes a virtuous cycle. It just becomes a snowball effect. Uh, and many things in India actually are, for a lot of people, other countries are headwinds, those in India are tailwinds. Not just demographics, but even debt. India has a relatively low debt ratio, especially in the private sector. Uh, a lot of reforms, for example, we don't right now uh, tax high agricultural incomes. Now, as the political economy changes and less and less people are farmers, it becomes easier to sell that at least crorepati farmers can be charged, right? You're not actually charging the poor farmer. Right now, it's a political hot potato. Then you get more fiscal capacity. You lay out more infrastructure, which leads to more growth. So in India, a lot of virtuous cycle is remaining, whereas in some other countries, they're on the relative peak. And for them, it's more of a vicious cycle. Uh, I will add to this, uh, Hush, with your permission. Yes, uh, This is a very relevant uh, question. Um, we have a joint venture in Sri Lanka. And uh, when you talk to Sri Lankans, uh, it's almost as if they want to get hooked on to uh, India as a state and India uh, Indian economy. And for those of you who are following Pakistan, uh, there's a huge uh, structural change happening in Pakistan. Uh, it's likely to disintegrate into five uh, states of five so nations. So I'll simply add there, I mean, may or may not disintegrate for, I mean, they have an army with nuclear weapons, we know, sure. but what is definitely happening in Pakistan right now is there is a massive lobby building up which, which says that de facto forget Kashmir, accept right. India's abrogation of 370, and go and request them for trade. Which, you know, because if you remember when uh, Bajwa talked about, their last general talked about geoeconomics, at the last moment Imran Khan government vetoed it, the last government, saying no, we cannot buy cheap sugar or cheap medicines just because we, that's because it's cheaper because Kashmir and etc. Yesterday was Kashmir Solidarity Day when General Parvez Musharraf died. So there is an increasing lobby saying that we are basically bankrupt, China is too far, the Belt Road is too much debt, we must go and request the Indians for trade and we must basically forget Kashmir. I mean, it, it, they will not word it openly that way. So it, that will be another virtuous cycle in the sense that India's geopolitics uh, will become relatively less obstructed 
because the terms on which it will happen will be on Indian terms. In fact, uh, Gilkit Balkistan, there's already a move. Yes. And Saudi Arabia and UAE have already told Pakistan, forget Kashmir. I mean, Saudi Arabia and UAE are actually very good examples of that. You know, what Pakistan thought of as their Sunni brethren are much more, because of geoeconomics, much more interested in the Indian market. And I think, therefore, this is, this is just the early days. By the way, till the 1960s, the Indian rupee was uh, the currency of, in the Gulf. Till 1966, I think. Yes, they had the rupee. And uh, till 1870s, Singapore was governed from India. So you, these things move in cycles. We are very interesting phase. That's all I can say. Can we close the conversation? Because, yes. See, six months back, myself and Mayur, we had visited uh, Harshji at his uh, residence. He had the same, I think, club. And we had one hour conversation and that is how this topic has come India by 2047. And he narrated some stories, you know, that he was called by Prime Minister uh, in a group for five minutes and Prime Minister spent 45 minutes with them telling what he wants to do in the next 20-25 years. I would like him to narrate that story because that is what people know, how much confident Prime Minister is. We may not be confident that whether the government will come in 2024 or not. But he's planning for next 25 years. And if person is so confident, definitely a lot of things will happen. So would you please just so, so, okay. narrate the story? So this is 2018 actually. So this is even before the 2019 re-election was won. And a small group of around 10 people, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister, and I was obviously very honored to be one of those people who went there. Um, it was supposed to be a half an hour meeting. Uh, it lasted for three and a half hours. I must say the Prime Minister is an incredibly good listener. Uh, I could not listen to 10 people talk so much for so long. So uh, something to learn from him. Um, and you know, on a serious note, he said a very interesting thing, which I think it's fair to, I think I'm allowed to share uh, publicly. He said, pehle paach varsho mein koi bhi sarkar ko pichle sarkar se compare karna chahiye. So maad dan uska hona chahiye. The reference point should be the last government. From year six to 10, the next five years, the uh, point of comparison should be the manifesto of the, the political party that won the election, right? If they get re-elected. So, pehle paat saal, pichle government se compare karo, agle paat saal, manifesto se compare karo. Or, 10th to 15th year, which goes to the point that Sir jo keh ki, the confidence, you should then compare it to your Mahatva Kanshai. Like, you as a common, honest citizen, what your genuine aspirations are, the 10th to 15th year, should, that should be the mapdand. And I thought it was such a, a confident but such a sensible way to think about it. Because again, in a democracy, things do move slowly. There are, there is, thank God, there's proper procedures of land acquisition, environmental clearances, bureaucracy, good and bad of it. But once things move, then they stay permanently. So I thought the Prime Minister sounded very confident. And of course, then he got re-elected with an even bigger majority in 2019. And for him to take the kind of risks he has taken in the last full budgets, both before 2019 and now, to not go all out for, uh, you know, welfareism or have the kind of national farm waiver that the UPA had just before the 2009 election, instead actually give a tax cut at the highest marginal tax rate. I think that shows remarkable political confidence and more importantly, commitment to the national interest. Because it was that that tax was increased surcharge in right after 2019 election, the government wanted to roll it back, but then pandemic started. And what has happened is, we don't want, uh, just because we are very large or potentially very large, we don't want talent to leave India. We want more talent to come to India. And there's a Laffer, Laffer curve tax effect that if you have moderate taxes, you actually collect more money. There is less, there is less tax evasion, more tax compliance. Uh, but politically, it can be difficult to sell at times. So the fact that the Prime Minister was so confident, both in his words and in his actions, in constantly delivering what is good for the country. Biggest example being infrastructure, because it's difficult to sell in the short term. I think was, I mean, I, I was very amazed and continue to remain so. Wonderful. So, Ravi ji, uh, with your permission and Ashji, uh, we'll call this session to an end. Uh, the vote of, vote of thanks may uh, start. Hey, Boldu? Uh, Ashji, and uh, to all the people here in this uh, audience, इस सभा की जो आईक्यू है ना बहुत हाई है और इसीलिए हम इस सुन पा रहे पूछ पा रहे और अनवेशन भी कर पा रहे तो इस सभा में जो भी उपस्थित है उनको मैं हार्दिक धन्यवाद बोलना चाहूँगा हर्ष जी आपको भी मैं 
हार्दिक धन्यवाद बोलना चाहूँगा रवि जी आपने इसका इच्छा किया कि यह होना चाहिए और हमारे शेयर होल्डर्स से भी मैं हार्दिक आभार व्यक्त करना चाहूँगा कि हम इस कार्यक्रम को कर सके आज और ये बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण विषय है कि दो में हम कैसे हो गए ये तो सिर्फ एक नंबर है मगर मैं सोचता हूँ कि भारत जो था ज़ीरो बी में या फिर 1630 में वो दिन वापस आएंगे इस शब्द के साथ मैं इस कार्यक्रम को विराम करता हूँ धन्यवाद शुक्रिया जय हिंद इससे इट इज़ बियॉन्ड दिस आई हैव टू से समथिंग कि भाई वर्ल्ड हिंदू इकोनॉमिक फोरम जो है वो विश्व हिंदू परिषद का एक पार्ट है विश्व हिंदू परिषद बहुत काम कर रहा है और उसके लिए हमने एक यहाँ पे पेपर रखा हुआ है कि क्या क्या काम कर रहे हैं हम लोग चाहते हैं कि आप लोग समय नहीं दे सकते हैं तो कम से कम पैसा तो दीजिए हजारों काम चल रहे हैं और हम लोग लोगों को वेल्थ क्रिएटर्स बना रहे हैं लेकिन यदि ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को ही पैसा नहीं आएगा तो काम कौन करेगा और इसी की वजह से हम लोग जो मैंने पहले ही बताया था कि वी लॉस्ट और ग्राउंड फ्रॉम थर्टी परसेंट टू वन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट जस्ट बिकॉज हम लोग कॉम्प्लेसेंट हो गए थे भाई कोई तो देख लेगा भाई कोई देखने वाला है तो आर एस एस है विश्व हिंदू परिषद है यदि आप आज उनका ख्याल नहीं रखेंगे तो वही हालत होगा कि हम सोच रहे हैं कि थर्टी परसेंट पर जाएंगे फिर वापस वन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट पर जाएंगे सो नाउ वी आर अवेयर वी आर इनलाइटन वी हैव द नॉलेज एवरी थिंग इज विद बट इफ रिच पीपल डोंट कम फॉरवर्ड ऑन देयर ओन एंड हेल्प देयर फुट सोल्जर्स देन विल बी इन ट्रेवल तो प्लीज डू गिव एज मच एज यू कैन इट इज नॉट गिव वन परसेंट टू परसेंट गिव मोस्ट मोर देन वॉट यू कैन गिव सो दैट द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन वर्क फॉर यू तो प्लीज डोनेट हार्टली